Welcome to another episode of Canopy Practice Success Podcast. I am your host, one of your hosts, Casey Brothers, and I'm here with Dominic Piscopo, who is the founder of Big Four Transparency. Um, Hi, Casey. The, the name in and of itself kind of gives a teaser, but why don't you introduce what you do, Dominic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I created Big Four Transparency about three years ago. It's a crowdsourced database of accounting salaries. And essentially, the idea behind it was just, why don't we all come together and kind of create this great resource for ourselves to be able to use and figure out how much we should be getting compensated in the market. So this is re really a, a tool from a CPA built for CPAs and accounting professionals at wide, not, not just CPAs. I'm trying to iron that bit out. But um, <laughs> and this was really kind of meant to scratch my own itch from when I was working in a big four firm where I thought it was extremely difficult to understand what the compensation curve looked like when I could expect to start making some real money. Um, I'm based in Canada. So some of the like starting salaries are a little bit lower here as well. Um, and just like understand, like, what am I working so hard for? What am I signing myself up for? And I think it's also just really valuable for people to be able to advocate for themselves. So yeah, basically, instead of having all these like broken up discussions online, I, I figured why not have a tool where we could kind of centralize all of that and build this database. Uh, and yeah, it's been used by a quarter million accounting professionals to date. We've got over well six done. or nearly 16,000 unique records uh, after cleaning. We've we've had a lot more submissions than that, but there were some data problems in the early days and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it's like pretty much anyone in North America, you should be able to find out exactly how much you should be getting compensated using this. So, um, yeah. And, and we're not talking just big four anymore then too, right? No. Yeah. The name was like, it was like a bit of a pun, like being big for <laughs> transparency. It was also like a, I don't really know SEO that well, but someone told me it would be a really good SEO play. I think I'm top of Google for big four salaries. So it kind of worked, but it's like, it is, it is absolutely not meant to be just the big four. Um, and the data is representative of that. There's a lot of people at small and medium firms as well, sharing their salaries. So, yeah. Yeah. So curious because a topic I see floating around all the time are conversations around pricing, uh, pricing of services, whether it's price points, pricing strategies, um, how much you work, how much you earn, revenue, profit, all that jazz. Um, mm -hmm. And there seems to always be a little bit of a sense of like, ah, oh, I, I can't, what am I worth? Maybe imposter syndrome there. Um, yeah. How do I do this? How do I communicate it? Should I do it? Um, what, if anything, and maybe I'm asking the wrong question. So if you, if I should be asking a different question, let me know. What, if anything, does your data tell you about um, the the way accounting professionals value themselves in terms of their salary, their income? Yeah, I mean, I think it all ties together. Like, I think compensation and pricing should be kind of part of the same discussion to a certain degree. So I think for a long time, like there was absolute just like a ton of wage stagnation, um, which is what I think sort of is at the root of a lot of this frustration from the compensation perspective. And the way that I kind of understand the two working together is that as a business owner or like a firm operator in this case, you essentially you're building a machine that makes money, right? Like you, you need to be able to create something where with a given amount of inputs, you can generate outputs where it makes sense to operate this business. So this is kind of the way that I think compensation and pricing tie in, where if you can't afford to, you know, stay competitive with the compensation market and pay your accounting professional staff what they should be getting paid in the market, that might actually be a little bit of a function of some issues in your own accounting firm as well. Right. Where you can't just kind of point at the market and say, oh, my God, it's unfair kids these days um, where actually it really is like compensation is what it is. And be especially now with like the talent shortage that we're seeing and, and increased competition to get, you know, talent through the door, 
you need to be able to kind of like operate your business in a way that is still profitable with what it costs to acquire and retain talent, right? So I do think that, yeah, like pricing and compensation, like go hand in hand and and accountants need to be able to essentially just advocate for themselves on both yes. fronts, right? And I mm-hmm. think for, for many that's been missing, which is maybe where kind of some of this wage stagnation over the last decade or so came from, where I think, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about accountants that I would challenge, but I would say in general, this is not a super conflict you know, seeking population. I think people are are relatively conflict averse, which again, like from the from the job standpoint, people maybe don't stand up for themselves as much in terms of like the compensation they should be asking for. But then from a firm standpoint, that then trickles down and enables bad pricing, where mm-hmm. just as much as it's difficult to have a conversation with your employer about, hey, I'm behind the market and I need to be compensated for what I'm worth. The firm then needs to basically carry on that conversation with the client and basically go, hey, we've been underbilling you for three or four years. We keep doing all this out of scope work. And that now needs to become a conversation because I need to be able to operate my business profitably. Right. So it, it's kind of like this whole chain of events where like really for the industry to move forward and for firms to still be like an attractive business model both things need to be happening, right? Like you need to attract and retain great talent, but you also need to be pricing accordingly. Otherwise, you're just going to have no margin left once you're paying to market, right? Yeah. And I, I've i never actually thought about this until you were just talking. But like, I, it makes me wonder what percent of accounting professionals in boutique-sized firms have worked at a big four before? And yeah. how much of this is inherited culture or um you know a lot of those decisions too with you know, big four right pricing stuff is not in your control as the accountant with the skills mm-hmm. that does the work but when you're in a boutique firm it's a completely different ball game you're entering an entrepreneur's world um and you're not taught this it's so funny i i have mentioned on another episode before how i feel like accountants are the the best fit to be a business owners because you have you have baked in you the skills to have business um financial operational skills right you know concepts yeah. of P&Ls and all of that but it's so different when it's you looking at you and you're like oh, can, can I do or or taking the time even slowing down to speed up? That's another thing that like I'm a big advocate yeah. of, and I know I've said before um, that it's not just about getting in and getting clients. There's you need to do that reflection and work on the business, and not just take um, culture or operations that you've experienced at a large firm. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people I think are kind of like shown a way of doing things that's not super yeah. great for the long term and in operating their own businesses. So you need to kind of you need to kind of figure out a way to find the things that you need to change and refine for your own business and and make them work that way. And yeah, like I I do think that accountants are starting off on a good foot with like you, know, you have this financial understanding, you 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 know, you're able to interpret results and stuff like that. But there is a lot more to it, I think, when it comes down to it, which is, which is, yeah, like, you need to have a lot of difficult conversations. And that's something that I think a lot of people are really averse to. And um, often, like, you're kind of shielded from in the big four as well. Like, yeah. we, so I, I worked in tax for about three years at Deloitte. And yeah, like, I was never really the one to have the hard client conversation or anything like mm-hmm. that. I was, our, our office was like really, was really a good office, I will say. And we were very empowered to like put our hand up and be like, I think we're underbilling this client, like someone come take a look at this, but we were never actually like exposed to having the conversation. And I think it was yeah. really the partner who was doing that. Whereas again, in some smaller, more boutique places, like you probably need to be ready to do that as early as manager, right? 
Um, whereas that's often not really the case in the accounting firms, uh, in the, in the very yeah. large accounting firms. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. I, um, I don't use Reddit in my personal life and maybe yeah. I should, because it is fascinating. Whenever I go to learn something about accountants, Reddit is where I go. Yeah. Um, and it is so interesting to see the comments people make about getting fed up with these institutions and the culture, the hours, um, whatever it might be and be like, Hey, I'm thinking about branching out on my own. Um, any advice, you know, mm -hmm. I, these are common, common posts. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, the accounting Reddit, I think is incredible. Um, I have I have a, a good friend that I work with who is in engineering and he, he like he browses the accounting Reddit. He's like, this is so fascinating, like the culture you all have. And like, um, <laughs> I, I think we actually like we have some kind of special there. It's a really, really, really good group there. But yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of people on there are very kind of sick of the status quo. Um, this is a conversation I've had with a lot of either firm operators or heads of people in culture over on my own podcast as well. So um, we, we've had a lot of conversations around this where it just seems like the, the existing model that's in place, which is kind of sacrifice, 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 and then one day you'll become mm -hmm. partner, um, is just not a real incentive for people anymore. Um, no. So even people like myself, like, there was there were a few issues that kind of led to me leaving. But like one of them was, yeah, seeing the lifestyle of accounting firm partners. And I was just like, I, this isn't super interesting to me. And like, I think a lot of people have kind of reevaluated their lives. Some people say COVID helped with this and, and kind of pushed this. And I think that there is that I think there's also just a bit of a generational shift. But a lot of people have evaluated the path that they're on, they put their head up, they look at the lives of partners and they go, you know what, that's not for me. And as an accounting professional, you have very lucrative opportunities ahead of you. Like you can go to industry and do super well. You can do your own firm. You can go to a smaller firm that'll respect lifestyle. And so I think a lot of people are kind of making the, the determination of like, I would rather make two to $400,000 a year working very reasonable hours than to make seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year and never see my kids right yeah um so i think that that's like a big thing that the industry is facing and a lot of people are are really kind of like coming about that and, and making that determination for themselves and you know what for some people the big four partner track is perfect and that's fine and that's good for them um, I just think an increasing number of people are are kind of finding themselves going like, I don't think this is for me. And I don't think this is what I want to pursue. And so like yeah. enter kind of the the lifestyle first firm, like I'm having a lot of conversations with people like Brandon Hall, or like Yuri, um, like as a sole practitioner, but like people who are just saying like, hold on, we can do things better. We might have a slightly lower margin. Or maybe honestly, maybe even not, maybe your margins will be just as good. And we'll just do this thing without overworking everyone. And we're just going to put lifestyle first and we're going to have great employee retention. And, you know, and we're just going to try taking a crack at this differently. And I'm sure at that point, like the promise of partner, like you might make $100,000 less a year, but like to most people, I think that that's way more appealing. Yeah, I think especially we're seeing this in younger generations from millennials on down, yeah. um, this unwillingness to participate in these odd bad badges of honor. Yeah. You know, of, I only get so many hours of sleep and it's like, great, don't put in a blue ribbon on your chest, who cares? Yeah. Are you, you're sacri you're risking your mental health. I only, or I, I'm, no one would say this out loud, but, um, I'm 50 pounds overweight. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like all these things that like really do affect life satisfaction. Um, you mentioned kids, you know, I only spend an hour a week with my kids. These are not badges of honor that anybody claims to have, but somehow they still pin on their chest willingly. Yeah. And it's not 
necessary. I, I don't think it was ever necessary, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think people are finally realizing that they have the power to push against it. Yeah. Yeah. And thank goodness. Because even like some coworkers who were, yeah, like in the millennial generation, like just a couple of years older than me kind of thing would make those comments sometimes when I was at the big four. It was just like, oh, early night, eh? Oh, it must be nice packing it in early. And I'm leaving at like 9 p.m. And I'm like, I've done my work. Like, this doesn't have to be miserable. Like, no. there's no reason to. And some of these people are just on their phone all day anyways, right? Like, it's like, there's there's really, really no reason for that. And yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that people are kind of like moving past that a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what do you say... Um, we do still see a lot of people in their near retirement ages. Mm -hmm. um, at, not a big four. We're just talking local firms, no matter the size. Yeah. Um, still in partners, still influencing the culture and maybe still carrying this badge of honor culture that we were just talking about. Yeah. How do you talk to them or how do you talk to the people at the firm to help in this shift to say, I mean, do, uh, do they have to give up? Do they have to um, sacrifice their margins? You've talked about that. Do they have to sacrifice their compensation? I mean, you had, you did say like, okay, maybe you're making mm -hmm. two to $400,000 less a year to gain back some life. So like what, what's on the chopping block and what actually isn't, what might be some myths here? Well, I think one of the biggest things is like people like I, I think there is a bit of a breaking point and it'll happen at different times for different mm -hmm. firms. But like some of the stress that flows up to partner essentially just comes from like not being able to like retain good talent. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because, again, if you're underpaying people, they're going to leave, like especially right now when like yeah. there's a super hot market for accounts. So like as you fail to retain people well like the buck stops with the partners like that's yeah. the thing is like if there's a client issue and the manager who would have dealt with that just left and the new manager has no idea like what's going on in that file left or what's going on in that file yet like it's it's the partner who's gonna have to figure it out at the end of the day right or they're gonna lose that piece of business and that might happen anyways at this point because them having to step in like they probably don't have time to do the whole client interaction thing in the way that it should have been done right so at a certain point like i think just more and more and more and more gets pushed up on the partners if they're not doing a good job of keeping their people happy and at a certain point it becomes like the sound business decision from like a purely capitalist perspective of like hey we need to make this a better place to work right because at the end of the day, like you're losing business, you're losing clients, and you're getting sleepless nights. So it goes a little bit beyond just like them having to make the decision to improve their own lifestyle. I think it is at a certain point, it becomes about profitability again, like it kind of goes full circle, where you've tried so hard to squeeze out everything out of this business that it is now like backfiring, and you're kind of losing people, right? So yeah it's it's hard to like say exactly how that's gonna go down for them like you know because these people still exist and some are more stubborn than others and right like some people might hold out for a really long time and yeah. um all I can do from my side is you know try to have some of these conversations with people and um you know, I hope to be able to kind of share some more case studies in the years to come of firms that I'm working with who have come to me and said, I want to pay near the top of market and I want to see how that goes um, while not overworking my staff, uh, because I think those are going to be really, really positive case studies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of other people out there kind of with bigger audiences than mine as well, really advocating for this type of stuff. And I think just eventually, right, as more and more people talk about it, it's going to reach more and more, more and more folks. Um, and you know, for the most stubborn firms who really just don't want to adapt, like, I think eventually it's just going to become a business thing and they're just going to not be able to grow and they're going to start kind of losing client work. Cause you can't just, you can't do everything yourself. Right. Um, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in this day and age, there, there's more to scaling than burning the midnight oil. And, and yeah. I personally felt that way for a long time. 
Yeah. Um, that, you know, we're, we're in an industry too, where we have large, and I'm going to go there because I work for a software company. So yeah. we have large software companies who have been around for 50 years. Yeah. Um, and it's tools that people are used to. And I'm sorry, but in 2024 to scale, to break down these cultural misnomers, myths of, um, I, I've got to work in order to bring in the bucks, right? Yeah. Um, it's like, there are other ways too. You can gear or you can oil up your gears. You can create more efficiencies, all of these different things. And we have so many tools in yeah. place available. Um, but the taking of the time seems to be really hard because for so long too, there's just the mentality of time is money. Yeah. How, how can I set aside time to rework my operations, to rethink my tech stack, to renegotiate salaries, to do all of these things that really will put them in a healthier spot as a firm, yeah. not just personally for work life balance, but also in terms of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. I think like a lot comes down to being like willing to kind of make the investment, right? Like I've yeah. always been that person who I also like, I hate a manual task. Like I want to spend the 20 hours to build the thing that's going to save me one hour a month. And I'm like, Hey, over two years, this will be good. Um, right. And, and like, you do need some people who kind of want to make those investments. And again, like software is coming a long way. And this is where I think people need to be more excited about progression uh, yeah. and less worried about it. Like everyone's, you know, talking about AI, um, mm -hmm. but even outside of AI, just task automation, like workflow improvements yep. and stuff like that. Like, I don't think that's something to be afraid of, because if you have this huge population of people who are working nine till seven and you can, you know, wipe out. 30% of jobs that might not look like 30% of accountants are now unemployed. That might look like all of these accountants who were working 30% too much are now just working a normal yeah. amount. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot to be excited for there and, and people really, really, really need to like take the time and look at your workflow because often things like they just really pay for themselves, both in terms of the financial investment and the time it took to implement it and softwares just keep getting better and better and easier to implement. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think like eventually it's just going to be really like undeniable. And it's like, if, again, firms who refuse to adapt and are still using paper are just going to go out of business because it's going to cost like so much money for them to be able to get anything out of the door versus someone who's actually like effective. And, um, and like, even from a talent perspective, like I think, people need to be smart about like the leverage for your time, right? Like if you have a partner who's doing so much on admin, but thinks getting an executive assistant is too expensive, like guess what? Like the opportunity cost of your time is yeah. so much more expensive. And like this other person now has a great job, right? And, and mm -hmm. you're, you've got your life back, right? So I think people really need to be open to what's out there and how they can kind of do things better for sure. Um, and that's going to be a huge piece to like the talent crisis is, you know what, maybe there are going to be less accountants in the market, but like we can do way more with less um, when we like improve our workflows. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. I feel like there are just so many signals in the industry right now between seeing fewer individuals graduating and choosing to go into an accounting firm, a more traditional path and going for in-house talent or even finance in general and not necessarily accounting. Um, there are so many trends and things happening right now that I think you said the word adapt several times. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to be the key that like you're, uh, I love this. There's this thing called the adoption curve uh, yeah. where you can be um, an early adopter um, all the way to a uh, laggard in terms of adopting things. And and there are pros and cons all along that, right? Um, yeah. It can be very 
based on your personality. But right now I feel like we're seeing, we're, we're still at the front of that adoption curve in terms of people making these changes. And sooner yeah. or later, people will be forced. There will be that huge group of laggards that like, there's no other option now. The, the industry has moved so dramatically to accommodate yeah. for these big shifts that now I'm maybe being left in the dust of it or having to sell off my firm or whatever it might be. But yeah. um, future proofing your firm now is all of these things, right? It's yeah helping you retain the talent by reevaluating. I mean, we, we could go through the laundry list again, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even when it comes to like exiting your firm, right? Like, yeah, some people mm -hmm. are getting kind of pushed to it, but some people go like, ah, like why adapt? I'm going to sell in two or three years anyways and take my retirement. But like, are you thinking about your exit multiple? Because yeah. like I've talked to a lot of people who are like acquiring firms and things like that. And, and like being up to date with the technologies yes. and like your strategies and stuff like that might be like a really busy six months or a year for your firm. But like you've spent 30 years building this thing and that might make the difference between a 0.9x and a 1.6x multiple on your revenues. Like, yeah, like you, you're getting a 50% higher return on that 30 years you invested just by modernizing your firm. Like that's so worthwhile Especially even. Yeah. I'm so glad you went there. Especially if you're talking about things you can do in that last stretch before you do exit and in yeah. terms of affecting that multiplier, like you think too, if you don't do that, take into account of inflation and all the different things of just like, like yeah. you'd be dumb not to modernize your firm before that. And, yeah. and in fact, if you can do it beforehand, it creates a better culture. We're, we're getting to the point where man, I know not everybody's going to watch this, but I'm holding up my phone. We all have smartphones and yeah. we all interact with apps that are user friendly um, and have quick, easy ways to interact with them and do business, whatever that business is, right? Whether that's a quick mm -hmm. text message, a video call, or even something like a DoorDash, who knows what, right? But yeah. we have these... Actually, I feel like um, there was research done a while ago on the effect that Amazon Prime, just the like two day free shipping had on the economy at scale. That it, mm. it wasn't just this thing that affected, was a differentiator for them and their, their market, but rather we now all have this thing to compare against yeah. our entire life, you know, like... And so yeah. Amazon two day delivery um, makes me impatient in other areas of my life. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so think, true. Right. But you think yeah. about bringing your firm into 2024, even though you may have an exit strategy, how instantly there, there will always be pains with change always. Yeah. Um, but you work through them and you get to the other side of, you know, being more efficient and you elevate the morale in your firm and, and who knows, maybe, yeah, maybe your exit is way better or acquisition, whatever the situation is, but you've also then contributed to a better, um, workplace, which I yeah. think is just a, a good place to end on in your career to feel so satisfied that you built this thing and it ended on a high note. Yeah. Yeah. I love having conversations with people who are like so conscious of the, the experience that they're creating for their employees and kind of like the responsibility that they have to like make this a positive experience for them. Um, that can provide great lives for them as well. Like I find those people like who have that type of empathy will kind of go the extra mile in terms of doing whatever it takes to kind of provide that. And and I think that makes for like great firm leaders, right? So, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, I think one of us froze for a sec. There we go. I, yeah, I, I missed a little bit of what you said. Um, oh, all good. Uh, but yeah, I feel like mm. we're just going to see more humanization, hopefully, right? Yeah, fingers Which crossed. I think only has a better impact only has a big, better, bigger impact on the industry at large. But Dominic, thank you so much. What a great conversation. Thank you again, Dominic. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks.